Well, Wendy Carr, our speaker today, is a very engaging licensed Unity teacher. I've taken her courses and she is amazing. She happens also to hold a Master of Arts degree in history with a minor in archival administration and records management. Sounds like a heavy load, but this was Wendy's ticket to dig very deeply into Unity Village archives and make some stunning discoveries. Please join me now in welcoming Wendy and get ready to learn something amazing about Unity. So let's jump right in with Nathan. And Nathan, our musician today, as you've heard, is an amazingly talented singer and songwriter. And throughout this year, he has been composing chants based on the 12 powers that we have been uh, bringing into our message every single week. So let's jump right in with Nathan and take it away, Nathan. Sitting up here on my high horse, sure do like the view. The grass looks greener on the other side. Don't know what to do If I keep all my options open Play it safe and wait or My whole life is gonna pass me by Time to step up to the plate I'm gonna have to jump right in Yes, I'm gonna jump right in You know I'm gonna jump right in To find out I can fly Dumpty sat on a wall Humpty Dumpty got a great call All the king's horses and all the king's men Couldn't put Humpty back together again Cause all they found where he landed Was his shell and his clothes His transformation was like total Where did he get to? I suppose He went and jumped right in Yes, he went and jumped right in You know he went and jumped right in To find out he could fly Well, I'm scared to jump But you know what they say You've got to feel the fear and do it anyway I might fall, I might cry But both feet are in and I'm not turning back Cause even if I get busted or maybe lose my shell I'll be a better man for it Or with some tales to tell Duck is tied to move forward The universe will move too And it's not what I do It's how I do it That's gonna see me through Yeah, I'm gonna jump right in Yes, I'm gonna jump right in you know I'm gonna jump right in to find out I can fly. Yeah, I'm gonna jump right in. You know I'm gonna jump right in. I said I'm gonna jump right in. Yes, I'm gonna jump right in. You know I'm gonna jump right in to find out I can fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nathan. That was awesome. Love the words. So welcome, everyone. Um, from my vantage point, this is part three of a three-part series. Uh, so if you want to know what the first two parts were, I will give you a brief overview. Um, but go to Unity of York Region and Unity of London. And that's where I've done the other two parts of this talk. So August is the month of the birth of both of Myrtle on the 6th and Charles on the 22nd, Fillmore, our co-founders. And our power, as Pixie's already indicated, is Will. And what I got thinking about is how did the 
Fillmore's use this power of will in their lives. And what I realized is that will actually has two sides to it. The willingness to release and the willingness to take on or to do or to be. Uh, and so those two parts of it go into our story of how we got the unity movement. So I'm going to take you back in time. So the, the photo that's there, uh, and thanks to the archives for gifting me so many pictures and documents that I've been able to share with people with their permission and blessing. Uh, this is from about 1928. It's, uh, as you can see, the tower is under construction and the education building, as it was when I was there, uh, is pretty much done. I can tell you from experience that uh, the inside wasn't done, but we were starting to grow a movement beyond the original small groups that would meet at the Fillmore's home and later in other homes. So my talk today, as you can see, is what can happen when you're willing? What does that mean to be willing? Well, let me give you a few examples. So in 1881, Myrtle gave up her teaching position. And that was huge for her. She was such a, a gifted teacher uh, to the point that the day that, of the wedding, her students were in tears. There was much apparently wailing and gnashing of teeth about the horrible, horrible Mr. Fillmore taking their beloved Miss Page away from them. But Myrtle had a vision of what was going to happen and that this was the next best step on her journey, that she was to marry Charles and be his wife and follow the, whatever journey lay before them. A few years later, Charles uh, gives up his business, gives up his own way of financing his wife, himself, and his now three children, uh, and chooses to follow a very spiritual path. In 1890, the Society of Silent Help, which is now called Silent Unity, is formed. So we're moving from very individual uh, understanding and expression into something a little bit more formalized, a little bit more um, universal, I would have to say. And then in 1891, Charles realizes that their initial uh, intention of having their ideas brought into regular churches, into traditional Christian churches, wasn't going to happen. And that it was going to be its own movement unto itself, and he calls it unity, and that's where we are. In 1892, late in the year, in December, uh, Charles and Myrtle write this dedication and covenant. Now, it's in Charles's hand. Um, uh, it took me a while before I could read his handwriting with any uh, skill. It, penmanship wasn't his great thing. Thank God he had, you know, good spiritual ideas and had people around him to capture them because uh, we would have lost a lot if we had been dependent on his handwriting. Uh, and I say that as someone who has crummy handwriting myself. So, But in this text, it reads, We, Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore, husband and wife, hereby dedicate ourselves, our time, our money, all we have and all we expect to have to the spirit of truth and through it to the Society of Silent Unity. It being understood and agreed that the said spirit of truth shall render unto us an equivalent for this dedication in peace of mind, health of body, wisdom, understanding, love, life, and an abundant supply of all things necessary to meet every want without making any of these things the object of our existence. In the presence of the conscious mind of Christ, the seventh day of December, Anno Domine, 1892, signed by Charles Murray. So this is the core statement of what the Fillmores were willing to do. They were willing to, to serve in an abundant uh, of, of ways, and this was what they expected in return. Now, you might say, well, geez, the 12 powers aren't represented there. No, they weren't, because Charles hadn't quite figured that part out. When you look at the material that's actually been published in book form, the first book is... Uh, Christian Healing, which comes out in 1905. And we have early prototypical 12 powers. 12 powers doesn't come until about 20 years after that. He wanted the time to get clear within himself of what these faculties were, what these teachings were that were coming through him, these ideas where he was questioning what was being said, what was being spoken, 
how translations of Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and Latin and other languages might have been mistranslated and how he wanted to get to the core of what it was scripture said. And so this is, this is what underpinned everything they did from this moment, from the moment that ink dried on this document until they each passed into another dimension of existence. So what's next? Now what? What do we do? We've got this plan of what it is we are willing to do to the spirit of truth, which was one of the terms that they used for God. They understood that God had baggage and that the you'll see over time that we move in languaging and unity from Father God all the way into oneness, which seems to be the most current term, because we're trying to describe the indescribable. And anyone for whom English is a second, third, fourth, fifth language will probably confirm that English is a really stupid language in ways. We have words that get pronounced differently. We have the better spelled the same. We have words that do not follow any apparent rules or they break the rules. So we, lang we language our spirituality as best we can. And that's been one of my frustrations, you might have gathered that, is trying to figure out how do we share these messages in a language that doesn't always work for us. So as we already saw, our, our affirmation for this month is, I use my power of will to choose to commit and to be willing. So the Fillmore's having created this whole set of document of uh, what it was they were willing to do and how they were going to do it. They came up with some challenges. There were challenges that emerged. And what I found really interesting, I hadn't realized this until we had our dress rehearsal for today's service on Friday. And I realized they faced the same challenges that we did, just slightly different with slightly different technology. So what is Unity's message? What is the message we are trying to bring to the world? It's all well and, and good to say, let there be peace on earth and we're thinking and feeling and loving and whatever, but how do we get that message to people who might not understand religion, period, full stop, or might have come through a religion that perhaps was a bit more abrasive and perhaps more controlling. And having to go through, as, as we heard, you know, the unlearning in order to learn. How do we capture that idea? The second thought, how do we best share the message? Once we identified the message, what's our best way to share? I know at my home church of Unity of Mississauga, this has been a big question. We've sold our building. We have no physical location in which to meet once COVID is over and it's safe to meet again. So how do we best share the message? Do we use Zoom? Do we use Facebook? What do we do? And then finally, do we focus on our in-person attendees, people we contact virtually, or a combination of the two? And you might say, well, how, how can you say virtually for Charles and Myrtle? And here they are leading a prayer service, uh, about 1926, I believe. Virtual contact in the time of the film wars would have been by mail or by telegram and eventually by phone. So it's not that they didn't have virtual congregations. They did, just not in the way that we feel the same way. But what I know from going through the archives is that we had these little study groups dotted all over the U.S. and actually all over Canada. Unity actually was growing quite nicely in Canada until the United Church showed up. And then a lot of the unity groups, we see them kind of fold because they're just little study groups. And many people chose to go to a larger congregation in the United Church than to stay with unity. And that's another area of study that is on my uh, list of to-dos. But the underlying ch challenges were exactly the same. How do we keep track of people's mailing addresses when we don't have a computer? And the way they did that, they had these huge card catalogs with an individual stamp for every person that was on their mailing list. So we have these simple challenges of how we get this message across. So what I'd like to do is share with you three of my favorite ways that are kind of unique to Unity. Um, might work for those of us that are trying to figure out what 
unity is going to look like as we come out of COVID or as we come into a place where COVID is still around, just not as, as uh, deadly as it is right now. So the first area is actually food. I mean, who doesn't love a, a good you know, meal? You know, the joke about the uh, children bringing their, their samples of their religion to, to school. You know, one brings a prayer book, another brings the mat on that she says his prayers. And the third child says, I'm from Unity, here's my plate of brownies. But the Fillmore's became vegetarians in 1895, and they made that conscious decision after their printer, a gentleman named Harry Church, said to them and pointed out the contradiction between what they were eating and what they believed. And so they became vegetarians. Ten years later, they opened Unity Inn, and it had a couple incarnations on Tracy Avenue. Uh, what you've seen on the screen are two shots I've taken out of a video that I had permission to share. Uh, showing the, the final building, which unfortunately has since burned down. Um, but they had the wisdom that they didn't want to limit it to just unity folk. So they had these buses that would go around the downtown core, pick up office people, bring them over for their lunch, and then take them back in a timely fashion. So it was a way to get the message out in a rather subtle way. And what is interesting to me and my favorite story about this inn is without this end, we would not have James Dilla Freeman. Without James Dilla Freeman, we wouldn't have the prayer for protection, the traveler, or a whole bunch of unity ministers who trained under him and then who went on to train other ministers. And how do we know this? Because Jim tells a story about how his parents divorced and he and his mother went off to Kansas City and she eventually got a new boyfriend. And the boyfriend was feeling unwell and someone suggested to him, he thought it might've been his dad, uh, you know, some pay back there, that he should eat oranges 24-7. But eventually he got word that there was this inn with vegetarian food. And Jim's stepdad, for want of a better term, uh, was a very gregarious person. And he said, you know, he dragged me along for, to, for lunch. And by the second day that we went, he knew everybody there. And they were talking, you know, first name basis and things like that. And it was through that introduction to people at Unity Inn that Jim eventually became part of the mail service and worked his way through a number of positions uh, before becoming the head of the ministerial school and eventually director of Silent Unity, uh, not to mention poet laureate. So this was a way to bring people in. The message was there, but it wasn't, you know, you didn't have to believe, you didn't have to be a Unity adherent to eat there. But it was a way you can imagine, you know, someone coming up with their tray and there's an empty table, but one person sitting there saying, you know, may I sit with you and having a conversation, opening up those ideas. So food was one of the ways of getting the message along. In 1922, uh, Unity arranged airtime on the Kansas City radio station W-O-Q, uh, and it's believed that that was the first time that there was a religious uh, sermon or talk given over the airwaves in Kansas City. The picture on the left of these gentlemen climbing a tower, creating the antenna for the radio station that they were about to buy, uh, has always horrified me. You do not see hard hats. You do not see any sign, because I, I look very closely at the original photo. Uh, any sign that they've tied themselves off. There's a, just this faith that they can build this antenna. So in 1924, they start broadcasting. Now, our co-founder was smart and sneaky. At that point in time, even though he had a license that said, thou shalt not put your gain any higher than, he knew that after midnight, nobody was really watching. Everybody was asleep because all the time zones would have been in the wee small hours of the night. And he would boost the gain and broadcast in the middle of the night. And what we know is that the radio signals being what they are with their bouncing around off the atmosphere landed in Africa. And that there were people in Africa with those tra crystal transistor radios and other people would walk for an hour to come and hear what Charles had to say. And that for a period of time, there was this boom of any child that was born. If it was a boy, it was named Charles. And if it was a girl, it was named Myrtle. 
because the message was getting through the signals that way. Now it landed until 1934, at which point between the depression and changes in technology and things, it was time to move on to other technology. But what a way to get a whole other part of the world tuned in, pardon the pun, to the message. And currently, as of this, uh, this year's AGM, we have a member of Unity Worldwide uh, Ministries Board of Directors who is from Nigeria. We have never really had international uh, participation like that. And we're really seeing this movement towards a truly international organization. And finally, uh, in similar vein, the creation of television spots. Originally, they were five minutes. That was because television had to give five minutes of free airtime to religious or charitable organizations. That was the rule. As we got into cable television, that became less and less necessary. And so it became a minute, minute and a half, and then 30 seconds. And the key person who facilitated this was Rosemary Fillmore Ray. And that was Charles and Little's granddaughter. And she just brought a whole bunch of things to our movement. Uh, I, I could do a whole talk just on her. 1956, she starts reading the Daily Word live on TV between Romper Room and Wizzo the Clown. And she was the filler that allowed them to get the kids off the stage for the one show and kids on the stage for the next show. And she would read literally the daily word. You would see the date, you would see the cover. She'd make sure she held the cover up to the camera. And actually when my late husband and I were going through school to become licensed unity teachers, we actually donated some of our time and talent indexing VHS tapes that had these recordings. We actually had a stack of old daily words and we went through them to cross-reference what uh, issue she was reading from. Eventually it was decided that they would take out the date and they would just reuse them. And that was that got a little bit harder trying to figure out which daily work was being read. Uh, but we did find most of them. And what amazes me is that there were so many large cities that were broadcasting these, even in the Bible Belt, which is kind of stunning when you think of the theology difference between the two organizations. Yes, we're all walking each other home, but we're going a very different path. In 1969, by at this point, uh, Rosemary is, is married to her second husband, Ralph, and they start to work on radio and television pieces. And she insists that they must go to Hollywood, that if they're going to ask uh, celebrities to donate their time for a, a one and a half to a one to one and a half minute spot, um, that they really need to do it in person. They really need to, uh, you know, make that face-to-face -face contact. So Ralph didn't like to fly. And so they drove. And I don't know how long it would take to get from Missouri to, to LA. I'm not going to try it. But they get to LA. It's late in the day. They don't have a hotel reservation in advance. And she sees the sign for the Bel Air Hotel. And she says to Ralph, let's go there. Let's just, I've always wanted to stay there. Can't we just stay there for one night? And Ralph, bless his soul, he was willing to turn the car around and he was willing to go in and see if they would take two bedraggled Midwest people who had been driving all day uh, without a reservation and would they be able to put them up. And she writes in her autobiography that he came out with this huge smile on his face because one of the people who lived at the Bel Air Hotel was Mrs. Robert Wagner Sr. Now you may remember Robert Wagner Jr. from TV from, and, and movies and she lived there permanently and her gift every year to the staff was a subscription to daily work. So not only was she able to open doors at the Bel Air Hotel where a number of the featured spots were filmed, but she also got an opening to a number of celebrities in the Hollywood circle, uh, not the least of which were uh, Steve Allen and Audrey Meadows, who attended one of the Unity churches in LA. 
So we have that, and that goes to 1992. And what I discovered when I was indexing all of these videos that they had of the TV spots was I realized I had watched these spots as a child before I even knew there was a thing called unity. And I truthfully never made the connection until 1995 when I went to Unity Village for the first time. And I went, wait a minute, I've seen this place before. So that's another way. Roseberry was willing to say, here I am. I will do what I can to facilitate this next jump in technology. 1996, we get our very first web page. I had the blessing of interviewing Rosemary in 1995, and I asked her about technology. I asked her about this internet that was really starting to gain momentum. And she looked at me, she said, oh, my grandfather would have had us on the internet far earlier than we will be. And this is the kind of thing to think outside the box, to look around and say, what can we use this technology for? What can we use the skill set of these people for? What is it that we can do and be that will make the unity movement so much better? And now I'm going to invite you. I'm going to invite Nathan to unmute himself and give us some lovely background music for our meditation because I would like to take us on a journey of being willing to move into something new. Nathan, whenever you're ready. As we move into a time of reflection and meditation, allowing the music to bring us into our within, into that space where we are connected heart to heart, hand to hand, soul to soul. We bring into our consciousness this idea, this affirmation. I am willing. And as we affirm it, we can add on. I am willing to think outside the box. I am willing to have my next best step revealed to me and I am willing to take that next best step. I am willing to be a beacon of light and love to this world. And I can do so simply by allowing the light and love to exude from me. I am willing to let go of thoughts, beliefs, memories that no longer serve me. And I am willing for new thoughts, beliefs, and memories to take up that empty space. And now as we allow this music to bring us into that inner space even deeper, I invite you to take these words, I am willing, and see where it leads you. I 
I am willing to stretch beyond my usual limits. I am willing to be all that I can be. And we say for and with this whole world, I am willing to be love, to be wholeness, to be prosperity, to be peace, to be the divine in expression. So it is, and so it shall be. Amen. Ever was and will be
That was awesome, Nathan. And Wendy, how fascinating, how reassuring it is to hear that your message. Thank you so, so much for sharing all your wisdom and work with us. And Nathan, for your beautiful, heartwarming songs. We are indeed blessed to have you both today as part of our community.